Let's welcome Academician of Academia Sinica, Dr. Peng Wang Jiakang. <laughs> Distinguished Research Fellow of Academia Sinica, Dr. Chen Ruihua. <laughs> Director of the NTU Cancer Center, Dr. Zheng Anli. University Professor of the University of California, Dr. Qian Xu. <laughs> the Laureate of the 2018 Tom Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science, Dr. Tony Hunter. <laughs> the President of NTU, Dr. Guo Dawei. Academician of Academia Sinica, Dr. Gong Xingjian. <laughs> Dean of NTU College of Life Science, Dr. Zheng Shitong. <laughs> Director of the NTU Cancer, Director of the NTU Center for International Academic Exchange College of Life Science, Dr. Ding Zhao Di. <laughs> Welcome. Good afternoon, distinguished guests. The Master's Forum of the 2018 Tom Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science would like to invite President Guo to give us the opening speech. Let us welcome President Guo. Our distinguished speaker, uh, the laureate of Tom Prize, uh, Professor Tony Hunter, our distinguished guests, uh, especially uh, uh, Professor Chen Xu, and also all the ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to our master forum and uh, the visiting and coming to our the, the, the best lecture hall of National Taiwan University. In this year, we are going to celebrate the 90th anniversary of our university. And this talk is actually a highlight of our series of celebration for the 90th anniversary. So i also like to use this opportunity to say that this is actually not just a highlight of the celebration, it's also a um, very good mark of our uh, milestone in our university history because we are going to have our uh, NTU Cancer Hospital in operation in December. That also uh, has a very good special meaning in the speech of our distinguished speaker because he's the pioneer in cancer research. In fact, precision medicine and also cancer research is actually one of the very core of research in our university. That also encourages a lot of very good opportunity for interdisciplinary research. So today we have a lot of people here. They can listen to the insights uh, of Professor uh, Tony Hunter. I'm sure that every one of us will learn a lot from the speech. So I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you, and I wish the best for you uh, for the listening and the learning in this great talk. Thank you very much. Please have a seat. Thank you, President Guo, for the wonderful opening. Now, we would like to invite our moderator for today's forum to give a welcoming remark. President Guo, Dr. Hunter, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and privilege to start this uh, master forum to be given by Professor Tony Hunter. We've had an exciting week of the town prize, and today 
is the grand finale. We're coming to the last part of the Town Prize Week, and we saved the best for last. We have the Master's Forum by Professor Hunter, and I'll give a brief introduction about Dr. Hunter's accomplishments, and if I were to do the whole thing, it would take the whole hour, but I will use a very uh, short time to introduce the highlights. Dr. Hunter was born in England uh, in 1943, and he went to Cambridge, get his BA and a PhD there, then served as a research fellow. In 1971, he came to the United States to work at the Salk Institute, first as a postdoctoral fellow, then became a faculty in molecular cellular biology, uh, rising to professor in 1982, and since 2011, he has been a Renato Del Becco Chair in Cancer Research. He also served as director of the Salk Institute uh, Cancer Center. In La Jolla, San Diego, he is also a faculty, uh, adjunct faculty at the University of California, San Diego, in the Division of Biology, and more recently in the Department of Pharmacology. Dr. Hunter has been elected to many honorific academies and societies as a member or a fellow, including being a fellow of the Royal Society of London in 1987. At that time, he was only 43 years of age. This is almost uh, unprecedented, uh, for, particularly for biologists, to be elected to the Royal Academy, which is one of the most distinguished uh, academic uh, organization. And then he was a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, and also American Philosophical Society, as well as the American Association for Cancer Research Academy. So he's uh, an honorary uh, member of fellows for all of these distinguished uh, organizations. He has won numerous awards and honors which would take a long time to present, but I just choose a few of them to list here, including the Gaitner uh, Award, Taylor Price, the American Cancer Society Medal, uh, Louisa Gross Horwitz, uh, Wolf Price, as you probably know, these are truly outstanding prizes, really uh, the most prestigious prizes in the world, um, and also Signal Transduction Society Honorary Man Medal, and particularly I'd like to mention the Royal Medal in Biological Sciences. Uh, the Royal Medal is given by the king or queen at the time uh, of the monarchy, and uh, given to one in physical sciences, one in biological sciences, and when to apply sciences. And Dr. Hunter was the winner in 2014 for the biological sciences. This is a very, very prestigious medal. And then uh, the Sherberg Prize is also outstanding. And just this year, he won the, uh, this Pascoller ACR International Award for Extraordinary Achievement in Cancer Research. Of course, uh, then we have uh, Dr. Tony Hunter as the uh, Town Prize Laureate in Biopharmaceutical Sciences. The 2018 Town Prize Laureates in Biopharmaceutical Science include uh, Drs. Tony Hunter, Brian Drucker, and John Mandelson for the discovery of protein tyrosine phosphorylation and tyrosine kinases as oncogens, leading to successful targeted cancer therapy. And Dr. Hunter made the groundbreaking discovery of protein tyrosine phosphorylation and tyrosine kinases in the late 1970s. This sowed the seed for research in the ensuing 40 years, leading to the elucidation of the fundamental principles of cell growth and cancer development, and also the creation of innovative approaches to treat cancer by either inhibiting the tyrosine kinase or blockade of 
receptor tyrosine kinase. And these treatments are very successful in treating cancer and saving a lot of people's life and uh, improve the uh, happiness and welfare of a human being. Truly fitting with the spirit of the town price created by Dr. Samuel Yin for the purpose of improving the health and well-being of humankind. So we're really extremely grateful to Dr. Tony Hunter for his outstanding accomplishments. And now he's going to give us the master forum uh, entitled 50 years in research and is still excited by a new result because he is, has new discoveries beyond the tyrosine phosphorylation such as histidine phosphorylation and many other things that's going to open up new chapters that will benefit so many more people. And we're very, very grateful for Dr. Hunter and we're very fortunate he will share his uh, experience and his uh, career and uh, thoughts with us, particularly for the younger generation, students and postdoctoral fellows, about how to pursue science and benefit humankind. Let us give the warmest welcome to Dr. Hunter. Thank you, uh, Professor Chen, President Guo, other distinguished guests, and of course all the students in the audience. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Of course, I'm absolutely honored to have received the 2018 Tang Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science together with my colleagues Brian Drucker and, and John Mendelssohn for the discovery of tyrosine phosphorylation and the development of drugs that antagonize tyrosine phosphorylation for um, cancer therapy. I'm also very grateful because it has given me the opportunity to get yet another t-shirt, <laughs> which I'm wearing today. Um, so the title is 50 Years of Research and How to Still Have Fun Doing Science. So as you've just heard, I was born 75 years ago in Ashford, in Kent, in England. And I went to a local preparatory school or uh, elementary school uh, in Ashford. And then at the age of 13, I was sent away to a boarding school in Essex, um, a so-called public school, uh, where I was specializing in, in science, as you'll see. From there, I went to Cambridge as you heard, got a degree in biochemistry, followed by uh, a graduate, a PhD, um, also in the Department of Biochemistry. So this is what I looked like shortly after I was born. I had, a, had fair hair then. Uh, whoops, there we go. And I, apparently I was already in, investigating. <laughs> As I said, I went to Friars uh, School and then to Felsted School. And here I am just uh, beginning high school or my time at Felsted. Uh, after I got my degree in biochemistry in Cambridge, I um, continued on as a graduate student in the department. Uh, Asher Corner was my advisor. And here I was in 1967. So I wasn't born with a beard, although I've had it for a very long time. And here's a, a snap taken by Tim Hunt, who some of you will know won the Nobel Prize for uh, his work on the cell cycle. It was a contemporary of mine of me eluting peptides uh, from a thin layer of chromatogram in 1967. So from Cambridge, I, I, I um, well, I had a, obtained a, an independent research fellowship uh, right after I graduated, and then from there I went to the Salk Institute to do postdoctoral studies. 
spent two years there and became a hippie. So this is what I looked like after I returned from California to Cambridge, rebelling with long hair. Um, and I became a fellow of the Christ College again for a year, looking around for a job. But finally, I ended up at the Salk Institute, and this was my green card to re-enter the United States to take up my faculty position. I look a bit like Charles Manson here, I think, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, and I became an assistant professor in, at the Salk Institute in, in 1975. So how did I become a scientist? Well, my father was an MD, but he didn't really push me to become a scientist or even a doctor, but clearly his interest in the nature of the human body led to an interest, my interest in biology. But it wasn't until I was sent away to Felsted, to the boarding school, that I really became interested in science. Within the first couple of weeks of me being at the school, the headmaster and my father had a, a phone conversation which ended up with me specializing in, in science, and I studied biology, chemistry, and physics. And then in my final year, I had a biology teacher who really had taught himself biochemistry, and he taught me what he knew. And on this basis, I, I won a scholarship to the University of Cambridge, uh, where I majored in natural sciences. So I had to do several different natural sciences. But in my final year, I, uh, I took, a biochemist, took biochemistry and graduated with a degree in biochemistry in 1965. At that point, someone in the department suggested I should uh, apply to be a graduate student in the department, which I did. And, I started in Asher Corners Group in October of, of 1965. So 1965, 53 years ago now, science was very different then. The genetic code had not yet been completely solved. It's hard to believe, but it was still happening when I became a graduate student. In Cambridge, the PhD programs were three years. So you had to finish in three years. My advisor, Asher Corner left in the middle of my second year to move to Sussex. And so I was left alone in Cambridge with nine other graduate students in, in uh, Asher Corner's lab, one of whom was Tim Hunt, with whom I collaborated. And Alan Munro, who was an assistant professor, was my surrogate advisor. I stayed on, as I said, as a research fellow of one of the Cambridge colleges, running my own lab right after I got my PhD. I came to Salk, I say by chance, actually I was following my first wife to San Diego. So she had decided she wanted to do a postdoc at the University of California, San Diego, and I had to find some place to work, and I ended up at the, at the Salk Institute quite by chance in some, se in some sense. I worked with Walter Eckhart, who had been studying polyomavirus, a DNA tumor virus as a model for human cancer. And so I switched fields entirely from protein synthesis, which I had been studying, to um, cancer research, if you like. Uh, my wife and I split up in the middle of the two years in California, and I went back to Cambridge to finish my college fellowship. I looked around for a position in England, and no one wanted me. And so, luckily, I had been offered a position as an assistant professor in the newly formed tumor virology laboratory at the Salk. And I ended up there uh, in, in 1975. I rose through the ranks pretty quickly. I ended up as full professor um, in 1982. And I spent the rest of my career there. So in many ways, this was this not a typical career path. I never had a job interview. Um, but things have worked out pretty well for me, I think. So just to chart my progress, this is Ashford in Kent, where I was uh, born in 1943. I moved to Felsted, um, which was founded in 1564 in, in 1956. From there, I went to Cambridge, which was founded in 1209 to be an undergraduate and graduate student. I moved to the Salk Institute, founded in 1960, and 
1971. I moved back to Cambridge in 1973, thinking I would stay in Cambridge for the rest of my life. Uh, but I returned again to the Salk Institute in, in 1975. As I say, I've been there ever since. So when I gave the laureate lecture on, on Saturday, I, I talked about the discovery of tyrosine phosphorylation, and I thought I would go through that again today. So the story started with my work on polyomavirus that I had um, originally done as a postdoc with Walter Eckhart, and then I returned to polyomavirus when I became a faculty member in 1975. And this time, when I was a postdoc, we were studying DNA replication, how the virus makes its DNA. And when I came back in 1975, I became interested in what proteins the virus makes to convert a normal cell into a cancer cell. And work from us and others had identified three proteins made by this virus when it infects cells. So it's a very small virus, only about five kilobase pairs. It has six genes. Three of them are made as soon as the virus enters the cell, and the other three are coat proteins that are needed for packaging the virus. So we knew that of the three proteins made early on, which are needed for the virus to induce the cell, to enter the cell cycle and initiate DNA synthesis, this protein, the so-called middle T or tumor antigen, was essential for, for cell transformation. So we had a protein, but we had no idea how it uh, worked to convert cells into a tumor cells. But in 1978, Mark Collette and Ray Erickson in Denver had reported that the transforming protein of another tumor virus, Ras sarcoma virus, the VSARC protein, had a, a protein kinase activity. And that was exciting because we knew protein kinases could phosphorylate and regulate other proteins in the cell. So we wondered if this might be a common mechanism of, of cell transformation by tumor viruses. And so we tested whether the polyoma middle T had such a kinase activity. And we did this by using um, anti-tumor serum, polyomavirus anti-tumor serum, to immunoprecipitate the middle T protein from uh, polyomavirus infected cells. And then we incubated this immunoprecipitate with gamma P32 labeled ATP, the substrate for the kinase and test whether something became phosphorylated. And in fact, much to our delight, we, we found that the middle T protein itself became phosphorylated. And uh, we found when we used viruses that um, we knew had mutations that prevented middle T from working, the middle T was no longer phosphorylated. So there was a correlation between this kinase activity and whether the virus could transform cells. So we weren't the only group who decided to do this experiment. Uh, Brian Schaffhausen and Tom Benjamin at Harvard and Alan Smith and uh, uh, Mike Freed at ICRF, the Cancer Research Institute in the center of London, did the same experiment and had come up with the same finding. As it happened that summer, uh, in June of 1979, Cold Spring Harbor, the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, annual symposium, was on tumor viruses. And so we presented our data there, as did the other two groups. And we decided that we would all co-submit our paper to um, papers to sell when we got back, and ours was submitted on June the 11th, uh, 1979. So you know, Cell is a hard journal to get your paper published in, and it was just as hard back in 1979. So here are the reviews of our paper. First review, reviewer number one said, these two findings force one to seriously consider the possibility that the activity is an in vitro artifact. That's not a, not a very good start. Reviewer two, the product of this in vitro protein kinase-like reaction was not characterized. 
with a very low reported activity and a denylation reaction of some, of some contaminant might be possible. And reviewer three, the most damning of the reviewers, unfortunately very few of these conclusions drawn by the authors are actually clearly substantiated by the data. So you would have thought the paper would be rejected outright, but in fact Ben Lewin, who was the longtime the founder and longtime editor of Cell, did what he wanted and decided the papers should be published after revision. So uh, reviewer two had noted that we hadn't characterized the product of this in vitro kinase reaction. And I already knew that this would be a likely reviewer question. And so the day after we submitted the paper, so this is now the uh, 12th of June, 1979, I set out to test which amino acid in middle T was being phosphorylated by this kinase. And that's what this experiment from my notebook says. We generated some P32 labeled middle T protein, cut it out of the gel, hydrolyzed it in six normal HCl to give you its constituent amino acids, and then ran these out um, on, a, on a thin layer plate. Uh, we added in some unlabeled phosphoserine and phosphothrenine, so we knew that that time the only amino acids that could be phosphorylated in proteins were serine and threonine. Uh, so I carried out the electrophoresis on June the 14th, 1979, and put the plate down after staining the phosphoserine and phosphothrenine markers um, overnight. So this is, exposed, this is the exposed X-ray film, which detects the P32. And you probably can't see anything on this, but with the eye of faith, there is actually a spot here. See it? No. When we expose the film longer, uh, four days now, you can see there is a real spot here. And the big surprise was it doesn't co-migrate with uh, phosphoserine or phosphothrenine, which we had stained with ninhydrin. So this could indeed have been some giant artifact, um, but I decided it, it could be important. And then the first thing you do, right, if you've um, got an unexpected result, is to repeat it and see whether it's right or not. So, um, oh, I actually said something here about the spot does not co coincide with phosphoserine or phosphothrenine markers. That was my comment about it at the time. So I repeated the experiment. Uh, about 10 days later now, we made some fresh P32 labeled middle T and um, got the same result. Okay, so it wasn't a total artifact. It could have been an in vitro artifact of some sort. Now, we generated this product by acid hydrolysis, so whatever it was, it had to be stable to acid treatment. And that meant it probably was a phosphate ester, which is stable to acid, and therefore it had to be a, another hydroxyl-containing amino acid, and the only one that I knew of, being a biochemist, was, uh, was tyrosine. There are only three hydroxy amino acids. And so one possible explanation was that this was phosphotyrosine. Um, so just to remind you then, uh, this is the structure of serine and threonine. This is the hydroxyl group that gets phosphorylated. This is the beta carbon of these amino acids. Here's tyrosine. It uh, has an aromatic ring, and the hydroxyl group is... Um, a phenolic group, so it's a very different type of hydroxyl group, but it is a hydroxyl group. So the idea was that phosphate could be added to this. So how can I test that? You couldn't go out and buy phosphotyrosine. There wasn't any internet around that you could search for phosphotyrosine. So I had to make some or try and make some, which I did. Of course, I'm a biochemist, I'm not a chemist, and so I didn't do a very good job. I mixed together phosphorus oxychloride and tyrosine in water, and everything turned black. Not a good sign, but in the end, I did extract a little of what I think was authentic phosphotyrosine. Um, and I ran this out on July the 2nd now. 
by itself, or with actually mixed in with phosphocerine and, and phosphothrenine, and I found a, an anhydrin spot migrating right where that radioactive spot uh, migrated. Okay, so this looked pretty exciting. Uh, so despite the possibility that this might be important, I left to raft a river in Idaho. Um, and didn't get back to La Jolla, because I went to a meeting in England till August the 6th. So here I am rafting on the Colorado, uh, not, this is the, uh, the Salmon River in Idaho. So that's me rowing here, you can see the beard here. Uh, two passengers here, one of which is my current wife. Amazingly enough, uh, she is still with me despite being made to go on whitewater rafting rivers. Um, when I got back, we developed a two-dimensional separation system where we used electrophoresis at pH 1.9. I should have pointed out this was uh, electrophoresis on a thin layer plate um, using a volatile buffer, which contains acetic acid and formic acid. And then this second dimension was chromatography. It was pretty clear that the spot we had generated from middle T um, was, in fact, phosphotyrosine. And so we included these data in the revised version of the paper. Um, we sent back on September the 25th. It was received at Cell on September the oh, it must have been September the 26th, and it was accepted the next day. So the paper was never reviewed again. It was simply accepted by Ben Lewin, who could do this sort of thing. Turns out the other two groups either were not asked or did not determine what amino acid was phosphorylated, and so we were the only group who reported tyrosine phosphorylation, and the paper came out in December of 1979. So at that point, we knew that there was something associated with middle T that could phosphorylate tyrosine in middle T itself. We weren't entirely sure whether this was going to be a final stable modification of proteins or whether it was some enzyme intermediate. We didn't really know any of these things. It turns out that um, the activity associated with middle T is actually the CSARC protein. But in more, more importantly, in some sense, I was lucky because to do the experiments, starting with that initial experiment in the middle of June, I had been too lazy to make up fresh electrophoresis buffer. And the pH 1.9 buffer I was using had actually over repeated usage fallen to pH 1.7. And it was because the pH was lower than it should have been that phosphotyrosine migrated away from phosphothreonine. So at pH 1.9, they migrate on top of one another. But at pH 1.7, the phosphotyrosine migrates uh, faster than, than phosphothreonine. So there was an element of, of luck in, in this discovery. So that was great. Uh, is it something unique to polyomavirus, or could it be important for other viruses, for human tumor cells? And Karen Beeman, a postdoc who trained with Peter Duisberg, had joined my lab as a postdoc um, in, in 1978, I guess. And she had brought with her her thesis project, which was the study of Ras sarcomavirus. So Ras sarcomavirus is an RNA tumor virus works very differently, and we knew the product of the VSARC gene, the transforming gene, had kinase activity, uh, and it had been reported to be a threonine kinase. So one day, uh, this was in September, September 18th, 1979, so this is um, just before we sent back the paper to sell. Um, I wanted to be certain that the phosphotyrosine was actually not an artifact of acid hydrolysis, and so I was doing a complete proteolysis experiment. And indeed, you get phosphotyrosine from middle T. Um, but at the same time, uh, because we were working on Ras sarcomavirus in the lab, I decided just to run a control of the SARC kinase product, which in this case phosphorylates the heavy chain of the antibody that it, that's uh, used to precipitate it. 
Uh, and much to my amazement, um, this also turned out to be phosphotyrosine. So Colette and Erickson had been misled by using fresh pH 1.9 buffer, and the phosphotyrosine that was generated in their experiments migrated on top of phosphothreonine, so they were unlucky. Um, so this autoradiogram and the thin layer plate on which um, the samples were analyzed is now on display in Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall. It's going to become part of the Tang Prize um, Museum when it opens later this year, I guess. So we carried out two-dimensional separation. In this case, yet another separation, pH 1.9 and... Oh, sorry, this is also that same separation. So this is the phosphotyrosine spot. And we developed a, a, a second type of two-dimensional separation with pH 3.5 and pH 1.9. And now we could analyze P32-label cell proteins from RAS sarcoma virus transformed cells. This is the virus used to infect chick cells. And... Um, if you look at the level of phosphotyrosine in an uninfected chick cell, there's just a faint trace of phosphotyrosine released by acid hydrolysis, um, whereas in the RSV transformed cells, there's clearly a, a large increase, about tenfold. So this suggested that the, the viral protein was phosphorylating cellular proteins on tyrosine. And we also had temperature-sensitive mutants of VSARC and showed that when you shifted the temperature of the cells, the level of phosphotyrosine rapidly dropped. And so this clearly was something the virus was doing. So this really told us then that both SART was a tyrosine kinase and it was using its tyrosine kinase activity to, to transform cells. So we could now begin to look for proteins phosphorylated by SART, find out what tyrosine phosphorylation does. Which I'm, but I'm not going to tell you about that. So this paper actually was submitted to, did it say here? Submitted to uh, PNAS um, in September. And the three reviewers are much more complementary. So these findings are both interesting and potentially extremely significant. The primary significance derives from the fact that the phosphorylation of tyrosine is such a novel activity. And here's a nice handwritten review saying no revisions necessary and immediate publication is strongly recommended. But this, um, this was in the old days before electronic publishing. It actually took four months for this to be published in PNAS and it came out, um, oh, it was communicated in November rather, came out uh, in March of 1980 with my colleague Bart Sefton. And all of the experiments for the polyomavirus uh, tyrosine kinase characterization and the SARC characterization were done in really short time frames. So that all of them were done within five months and the, the SARC kinase, tyrosine kinase experiments in less than one month. So we could do things pretty fast even before the advent of the true molecular biology. And I wrote a short history of this a couple of years ago. So um, this really um, sparked my interest in, in protein kinases. And so we continued to work on, on, on tyrosine kinases. Uh, and by the end of the first year, there were four tyrosine kinases uh, known. But the first uh, protein kinase uh, cDNA sequences began to be published. Uh, SARC was uh, one of the first ones. But the very first protein kinase sequence was that of the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, this line here, which was sequenced the old-fashioned way. In other words, this was sequenced, the protein was sequenced and not the cDNA. And I began to align these sequences, and uh, it became clear that the there were certain motifs in the catalytic domain, yellow lines here that were, yellow or green lines rather, that were conserved in all of the uh, protein kinase catalytic domains, whether they were uh, serine threonine kinases or, or tyrosine kinases. 
So that suggested there was going to be a conserved catalytic domain, although there were some, some motifs like this one which you could distinguish serine, threonine, and, and tyrosine kinases. So all of this was done before BLAST, so BB stands for before BLAST here, so this was all done by eye. And it turns out that the human eye and brain are pretty good at aligning uh, sequences. So these motifs actually have been very useful in, in diagnosing or defining whether a new sequence is a protein kinase, and also in, in, in isolating new protein kinases using uh, degenerate oligonucleotides for PCR between uh, these motifs. The first official protein kinase alignment came out in an unusual place. It came out in Scientific American rather than in a journal, because I wrote an article on the proteins of oncogenes where this was published. And then a more official version came out in an annual review of biochemistry. And so this was all now over 30 years ago. And with these motifs in hand, we can begin to say how many protein kinase genes there might be. And you can see that after a slow start with when protein kinase activities were identified, the advent of cloning and sequencing you know, in the mid to late 1970s, suddenly there was this explosion of protein kinase genes identified at the molecular level. And I predicted somewhat rashly maybe that um, a, a single genome, let's say a human genome, might, exp might contain as many as 1,001 protein kinases. When the human genome was sequenced, uh, in, uh, completely sequenced in, in 2001, it became possible to actually identify the number of protein kinase genes using these motifs. And um, with Gerard Manning uh, and the group at Sugen, we were able to identify 478 protein kinase genes in the human genome, which are displayed in this tree here. In addition, there are significant, about 30 or so, atypical protein kinases, which have been reported to have kinase activity, but are largely unrelated in sequence, except for these, the PI kinase-like kinases, ATM, ATR, mTOR, and DNA-PK, where some of the kinase motifs are present, but not all of them. But it turns out that they have a fold three-dimensional folds identical to that of the, the main protein kinase family. So altogether, 518 protein kinases. Interestingly, about 10% of these appear to lack catalytic activity. One or more of the motifs is damaged or missing, but these seem to serve as uh, scaffolds. They fold the same way as a protein kinase. And in the intervening uh, now uh, 16 years, a few new protein kinases have been added, and here's a nice review from the prior group, listing 535. So I think we're close to the total number now, 535, 540 possibly. All of the new protein kinases since our human kinome paper uh, are atypical protein kinases, but they are some of them are very important, like this FAM20C, protein, which is a secreted protein kinase. This is actually the enzyme that phosphorylates casein and probably the majority of secreted phosphoproteins in cells. So how many tyrosine kinases are there? Um, so we knew there was one in 1979 because we showed that the cellular SARC gene product had a was a tyrosine kinase. By the end of 1980, there were four tyrosine kinases. Importantly, including the EGF receptor. So this is an EGF-activated receptor tyrosine kinase. Um, so we already knew by the end of 1980 that these viral transforming tyrosine kinases were somehow usurping a cellular mitogen uh, signaling pathway. By the time the human genome uh, was reported, we could define 90 tyrosine kinases. So here is that branch of the tree. Uh, here is SARC, uh, here, tip of this branch. About half of these are receptor-like tyrosine kinases, like the EGF receptor, and the other half are non-receptor tyrosine kinases. And 
About half of these are implicated in, in cancer through mutation or amplification. And about one third of the kinome has been implicated in human disease. Uh, the majority in cancer, where there are mutations that activate tyrosine kinase, uh, like the EGF receptor or BCR ABL that uh, Brian Drucker worked on. And as a result, there was a great deal of interest and effort in developing uh, kinase inhibitors, particularly tyrosine kinase inhibitors by academia and, and pharma. And currently, 45 uh, kinase inhibitors are um, approved by the FDA in, in, the U in the US, and 32 of these are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, and these uh, all started with, with imatinib or Gleevec that uh, Brian Drucker was responsible for bringing to the, to the clinic and to approval. And that was in, in 2001. And you can see that there's just been a steady increase in the number of kinase inhibitors approved as drugs. Almost all for cancer research, but not quite all. Um, and almost all of these are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but again, not quite all. So this is a really a huge success story. We've gone from a basic discovery 40 years ago now to a whole array of, uh, of new drugs in the um, armamentarium of, of, of oncologists for, for treating uh, cancers in a, uh, a targeted way. So um, how does one stay excited for 50 years in, in research? Well, I stopped doing experiments uh, really in 1983, I think. I haven't worked at the bench since 1983, so it clearly wasn't me who was doing the research. But I was lucky to recruit some outstanding graduate students and um, postdocs into my lab over the years, about 80 postdocs and about 15 graduate students who have delved into many different areas of science. And that's the secret is to keep changing fields. I changed fields from protein synthesis when I was a graduate student and a research fellow to viral DNA replication when I was a postdoc. Um, and then when I started as a faculty member, I began working on the tumor virus transforming proteins, discovery of tyrosine phosphorylation and the general field of protein kinases and phosphorylation. But I had a new postdoc come to my lab from John Pines, from Tim Hunt's group, who started working on the cell cycle. We worked on the cell cycle for many years. Coincidentally, the main driver of the cell cycles, though we didn't know it at the time, are cyclin-dependent protein kinases. Uh, that led us into ubiquitilation, protein degradation, uh, DNA damage response, sumoylation, sumo-dependent ubiquitin ligases, worked on neural differentiation and metabolism, uh, most recently on histidine phosphorylation, and I'll just spend a few minutes talking about a couple of our most recent research areas that are keeping me excited right now. So that's histidine phosphorylation and, and pancreatic cancer. Whoops, misspelled. And altogether, nearly 600 publications over the last uh, 53 years. So. So very briefly then, I'll tell you five minutes on each of these. Um, although I, I was director of a cancer center, I've worked in the field of cancer research. I'd never really done a translational project in cancer. So I decided when I became cancer center director, I ought to be doing something translational. And so I became a member of a stand up to cancer pancreatic cancer dream team sent up to cancer as a, a US-based uh, fundraising charity that raises monies uh, through TV telethons. And they have set up um, dream teams, focusing each one, focusing on a different cancer. And I was part of a pancreatic cancer dream team. And our goal, there were three of us at the SOC, part of this team was to try and understand the contribution of the non-tumor cells, the stromal cells in pancreatic cancer. But just let me give you some background here. It's the third leading cause of cancer death. 
with the highest mortality rate, and it may soon become the second unless we find a treatment for it. Largely, this is because it's diagnosed too late. It's almost always diagnosed when it's metastasized, at a stage when it's almost impossible to treat surgically. So pancreatic cancer uh, has a series of characteristic genetic changes, like many cancers. This one is usually initiated by an activating mutation in the KRAS uh, GTPS gene. Uh, then the loss of the CDKN2A P16R CDK inhibitor gene. Um, then loss of function mutations in P53 tumor suppressor and SMAD4. And these are accompanied by uh, characteristic morphological changes, pan in, so for pancreatic uh, cancer in situ. Um, and then at the sort of pan in three stage, these become invasive and cells begin to break off and invade through the local tissue. Um, where they set up new foci of cancer cells and then ultimately can extravasate um, into the bloodstream, move around the body, uh, I mean intravasate into the bloodstream, extravasate out of the bloodstream where they can form metastases often in the liver. So this is the, the um, progression of pancreatic cancer. Now, solid tumors aren't just tumor cells, as many people think. They are a collection or a community of cells. Uh, so the tumor cells themselves are important, but there are blood vessels with endothelial cells, pericytes. There are usually macrophages and other cells from the immune system infiltrating the tumor. And then there are mesenchymal cells, sometimes called cancer-associated fibroblasts. But in, in the pancreatic cancer, there's a specialized stromal cell called a stellate cell. Stellate cells are resident in the pancreas. Um, they're quiescent, but they are activated and proliferate in response to uh, inflammation like pancreatitis or formation of a tumor. So these cells have a characteristic sort of star-shaped structure uh, when they're quiescent. And these cells uh, myofibroblasts, and they secrete massive amounts of extracellular matrix proteins and um, cytokines and chemokines. So if you look at a, a pathologist's slide of pancreatic cancer, you will see nests of tumor cells surrounded by stromal cells. Um, and most of these are activated stellate cells, and they're secreting things like collagen, fibrinogen, and forming a wall around the tumor cells. So Yushi, uh, a postdoc in the lab, um, became interested in the question of how these stellate cells, normal cells in one sense, uh, communicate with the tumor cells. Uh, through paracrine factors. So what, what, set, what proteins do these cells secrete that might act on the, on the tumor cells? And vice versa, what, what factors do the, stro the tumor cells secrete that could act on the stellate cells to activate them? And so I'm not going to take you through the data, um, but we identify all of the proteins secreted by both cell types. Each of them secretes about 2,000 different proteins. And we focused in on one of these proteins made by the stellate cells, leukemia inhibitory factor. So it's only produced by the activated stellate cells. And the hope was if, if we found something, we might be able to target it with a neutralizing antibody. Um, so LIF, as I, I'll call it, is a cytokine that activates um, a receptor which has a LIF binding subunit and it signals through a common GP130 subunit to activate the JAK tyrosine kinase, of course, uh, phosphorylates STAT, a transcription factor, which is latent in the cytoplasm. It then dimerizes, migrates into the nucleus and um, activates expression of factors like SOX2 and OCT4. So it's known as a stem cell factor. It's important for survival and um, 
pluripotency of, of stem cells, such as ES cells, and people use this in culturing ES cells. So this was sort of intriguing in the sense that we wondered if LIF might play a role in maintaining a stem cell-like population of tumor cells. So um, to test whether LIF made by the stellate cells might be important in pancreatic cancer progression, we used a mouse model of pancreatic cancer. So this is a genetic model in which um, an, activation, an activated mutant of KRAS is switched on as the pancreas developed, and P53 is deleted. And these mice developed pancreatic cancer very early in life. So the mice uh, weaned around day 21, somewhere around here. They already die by, on average, day 50. So a very aggressive tumor. So we could test whether LIF was doing, was an important target by treating these mice starting at uh, day 32, so that's back here before they start to die, um, with gemcitabine, a nucleoside analog that's used as standard of care in human pancreatic cancer, and a neutralizing antibody, monoclonal antibody against LIF. So we can inject the mice with gemcitabine and the LIF antibody. And what we find is, if you compare to control, that the gem plus anti-LIF treated mice show a significant increase in survival from 50 days now to around 65 days. And if we pre-treat the mice with chemotherapy, uh, NAB, paclitaxel, cisplatin, and gemcitabine, and now treat with anti-LIF antibody, we can get these mice to survive out to nearly 90 days. So based on this and other experiments I'm not showing you, it looks like um, LIF is playing a role, at least in this mouse model. And we find that in, in mice, the levels of LIF uh, increase steadily with age. Three weeks, five weeks, seven weeks. And we can begin to detect LIF in the serum of these KPC mice by about five weeks using an ELISA assay. So that allowed us actually to test whether this is also true in people. And so we obtained uh, human pancreatic cancer tissue samples and measured the levels of LIF. And you can see his normal pancreas levels low. All tumors have high levels of LIF. Uh, and we can also detect lift, high levels of LIF in the serum of pancreatic cancer patients. So we're hopeful then that LIF might serve as a biomarker for the disease, but also potentially a therapeutic target for the disease. And um, I think I'll skip that for time. Northern Biologics, uh, uh, a biotech company in Toronto, I have no financial interest in Northern Biologics, has developed a humanized LIF antibody that has just entered phase one clinical trials. And as part of those trials, it will be tested in human pancreatic cancer patients. So maybe in a few months' time, we'll, we'll know whether an anti-LIF therapy will be a useful therapy in pancreatic cancer. It, it certainly won't be a, a standalone treatment. It will be used in combination, but so this is, quite a, again, quite a satisfying outcome of um, my first translational project. So in the last few minutes, let me just turn to um, another new and perhaps most exciting project in the lab, which is histidine phosphorylation. So for 40 years, over nearly 40 years now, I've been working on the addition of phosphate to this hydroxyl group, tyrosine phosphorylation. Forms of phosphate ester, very stable to heat and to acid. But in addition to serine and threonine and tyrosine, six other amino acids can be phosphorylated in proteins. The three basic amino acids, cysteine, glutamate, and aspartate. And we know very little about these modifications, largely because they're all chemically very unstable and hard to study. 
So histidine attracted my attention 25 years ago because we already knew it was phosphorylated in some bacterial proteins. And it also has a ring like tyrosine. And there were some hints that antibodies could recognize phosphohistidine. So histidine has an imidazole ring with two nitrogens. Phosphate can be added to either nitrogen, one or three. In each case, you form a phosphorus nitrogen bond, so a phosphoramidate linkage. This is chemically unstable below pH 7, and it's unstable to heat. So it makes it very difficult to study. Uh, nonetheless, we thought we maybe could make antibodies to phosphohistidine the same way that people have made antibodies to phosphotyrosine, which proved so useful in studying um, tyrosine phosphorylation. So just briefly, we, we knew about histidine phosphorylation starting um, 1962 from the work of uh, Paul Boyer. But it's best understood in, in the case of these bacterial two-component signaling systems in which there's a surface receptor that's a histidine kinase that autophosphorylates itself to form a phosphohistidine enzyme intermediate. And that phosphate is transferred onto an aspartate in a relay, and that gives a signal output. But phosphohistidine is also found in, in eukaryotes, so some enzyme intermediates like phosphoglycerate mutase, um, ATP citrate lyase. But in addition, it is found as a stable modification of some proteins like um, histone H4. There are two reported histidine kinases, NME1 and NME2, which are actually normally thought of as housekeeping enzymes that use ATP to um, rephosphorylate nucleosides diphosphate, like GDP to GTP. And there are three potential phosphohistidine phosphatases. Um, I'll sk skip the previous slide. So in bacteria, you have these surface receptors autophosphorylate on a histidine in a ligand-dependent manner, transfer the phosphate to an aspartate in a second protein that gives you the right response output. In mammalian cells, you have these two enzymes that use a phosphohistidine intermediate to phosphorylate nucleotide diphosphates that can also phosphorylate histidine in proteins and three uh, phosphohistidine phosphatases. And there are a few examples where we know functions for these histidine phosphorylations, including this calcium-activated potassium channel where phosphorylation of this histidine in the C-terminal tail increases uh, channel opening and iron flux. So to make antibodies to phosphohistidine, we realized that the phosphohistidine itself was too unstable and wouldn't last in the immune system, so we needed stable analogs. And these two analogs, 1PTZA and 3PTZA, with phosphorus carbon linkages were reported by Tom Muir's group. And we use these, these are sort of uh, true amino acid analogs that can be incorporated into peptides. So we built degenerate peptides to try and make sequence independent phosphohistidine antibodies. So we use these to immunize rabbits. And um, if we look at the antibodies raised against 1PTZA, so this is the 1P his antibodies, they recognize NME1 the phosphoenzyme intermediate, but not phosphoglycerate mutase, which has a 3-phosphohistidine intermediate. But the 3-phosphohistidine antibodies recognize PGAM, but not NME1. Now, as a control, we always boil the samples, which discharges the phosphohistidine. And you can see here, when we boil the samples, most of the signal goes away in PGAM. So just as an aside, um, none of these blots, and these are immunoblots, I should have said, 
used boil samples. So you don't actually need to boil your samples in SDS sample buffer to get them to resolve on a gel. They equilibrate perfectly well at zero degrees. Most proteins, not all. So. Um, we use these the spleens from these rabbits to generate monoclonal antibodies, and um, here we plotted a series of pancreatic cancer cell lines with one of the 1P His antibodies. In each case, there is a control and a heated sample. Plus is heated. You can see the major positive bands are enemy one and enemy two themselves, but other bands that go away. The three P His antibodies, we tested E. coli and 293 cells, a lot of bands with three P His that um, a lot of them go away with heating. So we think probably three phosphohistidine is the main form in cells, but that's something we're still trying to find out. We can use these antibodies for immunostaining cells. Here are HeLa cells, growing HeLa cells stain with one of the three P His monoclonal antibodies. There's, there are nuclear speckles and these characteristic pair of dots here, which are the centrosomes. And you can see the spindle poles stain positive, suggesting histidine phosphorylation plays a role in. And cell cycle progression, we can also use these antibodies to um, ice, affinity isolate phosphohistidine proteins from cells. Um, we found around 800 proteins that were purified this way, which you have identified, um, many involved in RNA processing, um, translation, etc. Significant number in the cell cycle by GO analysis, as well as proteins that we already knew should contain phosphohistidine, like histone H4, enemy 1 and 2, and PGAM. We still need to map the histidine phosphorylation sites in this, these proteins, and that's proving to be difficult because conventional phosphoproteomic conditions eliminate phosphate from histidine, and so you don't find it. But we've got new methods, that we've, and we use these new methods to identify at least 100 new phosphohistidine can, uh, sites in proteins. I'll skip that. So finally then, this is all very well, useful new tools. Probably we'll learn a lot about histidine phosphorylation. But I have grants from the NCI, National Cancer Institute, and it would be nice if histidine phosphorylation played a role in cancer. And as it happens, it, it does seem to do this. Um, in a collaboration with Mike Hall in Basel, who developed a mouse model of, uh, of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma of, of liver cancer, by conditionally knocking out TSC1 and P10, uh, we have evidence that histidine phosphorylation is a driver in, in, uh, in liver cancer, rather. So these mice uh, with liver-specific knockout of these two genes develop rapid multifocal hepatocellular carcinoma within 10 to uh, 16 to 20 weeks. And my course group did a proteomic analysis for protein kinases and phosphatases that were up or down regulated and found enemy one and two, the histidine kinases, with the highest upregulated proteins. And LHPP, one of the phosphohistidine phosphatases, was one of the most strongly downregulated uh, phosphatases, which led. Um, us to collaborate to test whether there, was, there were changes in histidine phosphorylation in these liver samples. Uh, each case, there's a, there's a blots again with um, an unheated sample and a heated sample, and you can see that um, the tumors have strongly elevated 3P His proteins and also 1P His in enemy 1 and 2. That's about a two to three fold increase. And um, LHPP, the phosphatase, the phosphohistidine phosphatase, um, appears to be important in these liver tumors because if one expresses LHPP in the liver by injecting an AAV vector into the tail vein, you can see a significant decrease in the number and actually size of the tumors, suggesting that um, LHPP acts as a tumor suppressor. Once again, we needed to know whether this was true in humans, and Mike Hall has um, a 
a collaboration with clinicians in Basel who obtained human hepatocellular carcinoma tissue. And again, you can see an increase in the level of 3P HIS in the tumor samples compared to the, to the normal tissue. So this suggests then that LHPP is a, a, a tumor suppressor um, and that increased levels of three phosphohistidine proteins is playing a role in progression of these tumors. And what we obviously need to do is to identify which proteins are phosphorylated um, on histidine that might be driving this, this cancer. And ultimately, there may be opportunities for developing um, new types of therapy. So I'll, I'll draw this to a close and just thank the people who did the work uh, on, I described at the end, uh, on the pancreatic cancer was Yu Shi and Rujan Tian, and on the phosphohistine antibodies, uh, Steve Foos, uh, with help from Jill, Aaron, and, and Lee. And of course, I, I shouldn't end without thanking the people who worked with me on the phosphotyrosine story, particularly Walter Eckhart, who was my postdoc advisor and collaborated with us on the polyoma work, Bart Sefton and Marianne Hutchinson. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Please have a seat on the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hunter, for this marvelous uh, lecture uh, that uh, you've told us the uh, wonderful ways in which you pursue the uh, project in uh, tyrosine phosphorylation. Uh, how do you sort out the problem and go went at it in such uh, systematic ways to eventually succeed in this very difficult and important project, and also you're exciting new directions uh, using LIF uh, for the pancreatic cancer uh, and uh, the uh, histidine phosphorylation that uh, can have major effect on the liver cancer. So you're continually bringing up to new frontiers for the humankind. Uh, we really appreciate your uh, master uh, forum talk and we'd like to now open this for uh, uh, discussion. and. Uh, You'd like to yeah. invite the yeah. um, panelists? Yes, yes, thank you. Now, we would like to invite our panelists to the stage. Academician of Academia Sinica, Dr. Gong Xingjian. Director of the NTU Cancer Center, Dr. Zhen Anli. Distinguished Research Fellow of the Institute of Biological Chemistry at Academia Sinica, Dr. Chen Ruihua and our moderator this afternoon, University Professor of the University of California, Dr. Tian Xu. Please have a seat. Okay, okay. And thank you, Dr. Hunter, for sharing this inspiring talk with us. Please have a seat on stage. Thank you. So uh, please be seated, uh, uh, Dr. Hunter. Tony, you're going to take your uh, T-shirt off. I'm going to come up for Ah, okay. <laughs> so, is that my seat? Well, uh, when you came in, you, uh, the audience uh, has one of these sheets, uh, and this is for you to write down the questions. So if you can write down the questions, uh, including your name, uh, organization, and the content of the questions. For students, if you can put down the year, uh, either undergraduate or uh, graduate uh, school studying, that would be appreciated. So I think we have someone to collect these uh, uh, question sheets uh, that we will uh, then uh, present the questions uh, to Dr. Hunter. Uh, for uh, answers. But before we do that, I'd like to ask our three uh, panelists uh, to ask questions first. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Chen.
Thanks. Uh, Dr. Hunter, uh, your discovery of protein tyrosine phosphorylation and uh, tyrosine kinase were purely from basic research. And yet, these discoveries have great impact on the identification of drug target for cancer and has evolutionized the treatment strategy for this devastating disease. So to the audience, mostly the uh, young students, could you emphasize and comment on the importance of basic science to human health? Of course, yes. I'm a firm believer that we still don't understand everything. So while there's a big push from some funding agencies to try and encourage translational projects, I, th I still believe that uh, we need to fund and carry out basic blue sky research. Uh, a good example might be histidine phosphorylation. There's, there was no reason to think it necessarily would be involved in human disease, but our basic, disc basic research has led to the discovery that um, it could be important in human disease. And I'm sure there are many other areas of uh, research where additional information is going to be important in, in understanding and exploiting the discoveries for, um, for medical benefit. Uh, and so, yes, I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in basic research. Thank you, Tony. And uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hunter. Uh, thank you for your uh, really inspiring lectures. I think many uh, young scientists now sitting in this room are really encouraged by you. And I'm a cancer doctor, so I'm treating cancer patients every day. And I must say that nowadays we cannot uh, handle a patient well without prescribing some tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So thank you so much. And I have a question for you that um, for the past 20 more years, we have seen, as you said, two-thirds, even higher, 70 to 80 percent of the most effective treatment belong to tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So what happened to other kinase inhibitors, like acetylene swelling kinase inhibitor or other uh, kinase? Well, um, tyrosine kinase most of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors are directed against cell surface receptor tyrosine kinases. Well, that's not true for Gleevec, obviously. And their toxicity may be lower because there are many different receptor tyrosine kinases. Um, whereas most of the serine threonine tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like MEK inhibitors, uh, RAF inhibitors, those target kinases lie downstream of the receptor kinases and they're common pathways and so the toxicity of the um, downstream, inhibitors of downstream kinases tend to be greater and so it proves, has proved harder to um, develop inhibitors that have a uh, a reasonable toxicity profile. So there are MEK inhibitors in the clinic and BRAF inhibitors in the clinic. And it just took longer to develop them, I think, because these are sort of what people might call third rail kinases. There are kinases that are used by a lot of systems in the cell and therefore are likely to have adverse effects on, on the individual. So I think that's part of the problem there. Yeah, I'm a doctor working on liver cancer. Mm -hmm. So you have last few slides really encouraging because in the past 20, 30 years, we tried to use tyrosine kinase to treat liver cancer, but it's not very successful. And we keep thinking that we may be uh, in the wrong field <laughs> of the research to uh, cure cancer patient with hepatocellular carcinoma. So your story about histidine phosphorylation probably it's really a new area and very encouraging story for the people working on liver cancer. Thank you so much. Let's hope it does turn into something. It's early days, but you never know.
I mean, one issue with it, perhaps people in the audience don't know, one, one issue with using targeted inhibitors like signals transduction inhibitors like um, EGF receptor inhibitors is that cancer cells are very genetically plastic and they can f fairly readily find resistance mechanisms. And so that has been one of the challenges with using this new type of targeted drug is, is the development of resistant mechanisms and we're still figuring out how best to solve this problem. One way is to build second and third generation inhibitors, which has, has been done successfully. But I think the feeling is it may be better to use, combina rather than wait for resistance to occur, is to use combinations up front if they can be tolerated which will give the cells less of a chance to be able to develop a resistance mechanism. So I was talking to Brian Drucker about this for BCR ABL. There is a new allosteric inhibitor of um, the ABL kinase that is in clinical trials. And his feeling is that the way patients will be treated is to use a combination of Gleevec or some Gleevec follow-on and this new inhibitor at simultaneously at, at the outset of treatment. Thank you. Dr. Kung. Okay. Hi, hi, Tony. Uh, I'm going to ask you to play God a little bit in the, in the sense I'm coming back to basic science. The tyrosine kinase uh, discovery is certainly uh, groundbreaking, not just from the cancer biology from you, but also development biology point of view. And uh, it has always been fascinating to me that tyrosine kinase are, are privileged or reserved for uh, uh, animal, mostly animal kingdom, right? Uh, and it was suggested it's a regulator for a multicellular organism. It's a cell cell communication or cell organization. Uh, but plants you do not usually have it. They have uh, tyrosine kinase like uh, right. type of thing. So could you tell us a little bit maybe uh, why uh, the philosophy about the evolution of uh, tyrosine kinase? Bacteria has a little bit, but it's not really true tyrosine kinase, right? Right. So it, you know, it, it appears on the surface that tyrosine phosphorylation as a signaling system emerged simultaneously with multicellular organisms, although we now know that there are... Um, single cell organisms like coanoflagellates, monocega for instance, which do have tyrosine phosphorylation based signaling systems. In fact, monocega, one of the coanoflagellates, so it's a flagellated single cell organism, lives in the ocean, has more tyrosine kinase genes than I do. But most of those are unrelated to the vertebrate tyrosine kinases. So the, the coanoflagellates are known to lie on the branch of eukaryotes just before metazoans evolved. And so the feeling is that actually tyrosine kinase signaling involving tyrosine kinases, SH2 domains to recognize phosphotyrosine in phosphorylated proteins and the phosphatases evolved in the single cell stage and that rapidly led to the ability of those cells to become multicellular organisms where tyrosine phosphorylation is used for inter-signaling between cells. So it seems to have arisen now where the first tyrosine kinase came from is, is still a mystery. Um, I mean, yeast has, um, does use tyrosine phosphorylation, but only really for the MAP kinase pathway and for cell cycle control. In fact, there's a funny story here because Kathy Gould, who was a, a graduate student with me in the, um, in the 1980s, so after we discovered tyrosine phosphorylation, and she worked on the cloning of um, one of the EGF receptor tyrosine kinase targets, amongst other things. She did a postdoc with uh, Paul Nurse, who was currently then in Oxford in England. And her project was to um, study regulation of uh, 
CDK2, the cyclin dependent kinase 2, uh, uh, sorry, okay, CDC2, which is the, the key cyclin dependent kinase subunit that is needed for progression through the fish and yeast cell cycle. So, Paul Nurse worked on fish and yeast. So, she labeled these cells with P32, and she isolated CDC2. She did the phosphoaminoacid analysis, just like I showed you. And much to her amazement, she found phosphotyrosine. And so this was a total surprise that um, the yeast was going to be using, and she showed that it was critical for negative regulation of CDC2. So yeast uses tyrosine phosphorylation, but sparingly. Um, so really, it is not until you get to the, um, these uh, coanoflagellates and simple multicellular organisms like uh, sponges or hydra that uh, you see extensive tyrosine phosphorylation. Why, it's, why it took so long to evolve, I think, you know, to get a totally new function, particularly the SH2 domain, required a lot of luck. And there was some scaffold protein that looked a little like an SH2 domain that had to go through a lot of steps to become a binding protein. The phosphatases were already around. That wasn't probably, so I think SH, the evolution of SH2 domains probably was the limiting step here. Something that could recognize tyrosine phosphorylation and transmit the signal. And so who knows how evolution works, but it, it's true. It didn't happen in bacteria, although there are some tyrosine kinases, they're very different. Um, so it probably resulted, you know, probably had to wait for a series of evolutionary accidents before it took off as a major signaling system. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunter. Uh, now I have some questions from the audience. Uh, the first one here is from uh, Chen Liang, Ling Ling, Chen Ling Ling from Institute of Molecular Biology, Academia Sinica. The question is, why tyrosine kinases among all kinases are particularly associated with disease? Uh, is it because they are more involved in proliferation or more tightly regulated? Good question. Where is Chen Ling? Is he going to put up there? Oh, hi. Uh, it's probably a combination. I think they are key signaling proteins in proliferation. And so um, if you dysregulate them, then that is obviously a good way to drive continuing proliferation of, of cells. Um, whether they are more tightly regulated uh, than other signaling systems involved in mitogenic signaling? Probably. So it turns out that tyrosine phosphatases, which are um, unrelated to the serine threonine phosphatases, have an extremely high enzyme turnover number. So the phosphatases are about 1,000 to 10,000 times more active in terms of turnover of molecules per second than the kinases. And so that does mean that tyrosine phosphorylation of proteins is normally very um, strongly kept in check. And so it may be that just a little bit of an increase in the level of tyrosine phosphorylation can drive uh, phenotypic changes in cells. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. Thank you, Tony. Uh, when I read the uh, name uh, with the questioner, please kindly stand up. The next one is from Ming Jun Yu of National Taiwan University College of Medicine. Are you taking only uh, are you taking any leads on as aspartate phosphorylation? Aspartate phosphorylation. So the question is, where, where is he? Uh oh, hi. So are we doing anything with as aspartate phosphorylation? Is that the question? Yeah. yeah. So we um, are not really actively looking at aspartate phosphorylation, largely because we don't really have the tools to do that. But I should say that Claire Ayers at the University of Liverpool has developed methods for um, enrichment of 
phosphopeptides using strong anion exchange, which can be run under um, neutral conditions. And she has a paper in BioArchive, if you're interested, identifying hundreds of phosphoaspartate sites in uh, a HeLa cell proteome. So people are beginning to look at uh, aspartate and glutamate phosphorylation. And we are working on um, lysine phosphorylation. We're trying to make antibodies to phospholysine. And um, we've not done much with phosphoarginine, but there is quite a lot of work done on phosphoarginine in bacterial systems. And so there are antibodies already to phosphoarginine. So we are sort of looking at one part of the so-called hidden phosphoproteome. Our estimate and that of um, Claire's group is that about 20% of phosphate linked to proteins in, let's say, a 293 cell is linked to amino acids other than serine, threonine, or tyrosine. So there's a lot of things going on, a hidden regulatory systems, I think, that we still need to try and uncover. So there we need a lot of basic research. Thank you. The next question is for, from Yu Hui Chiu, Department of Biomedical Science and Technology of NTU. To study signal transduction, we know that the spatial and temporal axes are important. However, protein-protein contact might be transient, making these studies difficult. I'm wondering how to determine these parameters while conducting experiments. Thank you. Where are we here? Who's, who asked this question? Yu Hui Chu. Oh, there you are. Hi. Um, well, protein-protein interactions, particularly in the cellular environment, are key to many processes, including signal transduction. Probably what most people don't realize is that if you actually measure what fraction of the cytoplasm of a cell is water, it's only about 50%. So the protein concentration, or protein and everything else, you know, carbohydrates, lipids um, in cells, is incredibly high. And in fact, none of us do experiments under those conditions. Uh, which may be an issue, but, and in fact, there are now some very nice um, <coughs> modeling papers now that the compu computational power is high enough, you can actually begin to model what happens in a little tiny cubic volume of a cell when you have proteins present at that sort of concentration. And there was a nice paper in eLife a couple of years ago now, um, modeling what happens in a bacterial cytoplasm. And it's really amazing to watch these protein molecules bumping into one another and little molecules, metabolites and ions and things wandering around between them. So uh, protein-protein interactions are prob uh, certainly encouraged under those conditions because the concentration is so high that proteins which might not be stable interact stably in solution at dil under dilute conditions can interact in the cell. And I think there's a whole new frontier here of, of trying to understand how uh, protein-protein interactions actually work in the context of a real cytoplasm. And I think a lot of this will need um, probably at least two different approaches. One is you know, real-time imaging of protein movement in cells, uh, ideally multicolor, so you can follow several proteins at once. And the second, I think, will be cryo-EM analysis of whole cells. And that's a technology that's now being developed. You may know about cryo-EM for solving protein structures, but people are now applying, applying this to much more complex systems, in fact, whole cells, where you can do this process of focused iron beam milling, where you can freeze a cell and then you etch off a very, very thin layer whatever protein, you burn it off, and then you take a new cryo-EM image, and then you burn off another layer, and you slowly reconstruct a volume in the cell. And this actually has the potential now to show 
where proteins, to identify individual proteins, and where they are in the cell and how they are assembled into, into complexes. So I think this is going to be a whole new frontier in understanding um, many things about cells, but in particular signal transduction. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Zifan Zhang of NTU, somewhat related to an earlier question. Histidine kinase can transfer phosphate to aspartate. Uh, aspartate. Do you have convenient methods to probe aspartate phosphorylation? Where was I missed? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, we don't really have. I mean, people, you can analyze aspartate phosphorylation. I have a postdoc in the lab who worked on a, one of the two component systems where they did measure aspartate phosphorylation. As far as I'm aware, there aren't any antibodies to phosphoaspartate, but in principle it should be possible to make a stable analog and, and, and possibly make such antibodies. Um, but, you know, phos the phosphate is linked to the aspartate by a mixed acid anhydride, so it's a phosphorus carboxyl anhydride, and so that's, it's difficult to, it's not very stable, it's even probably less stable than uh, than phosphohistidine, so it's a, it's a challenge to study, and we know, as I said, very little about it in mammalian cells other than Claire Ayer's work suggests there may be a lot of phosphoaspartate sites in proteins. It's obviously would be a great area for someone, some young person to uh, start out on if they wanted a, a challenging problem. Thank you. Uh, the next three sheets were handed to me together. Maybe they're related, so I'll read all three of them. Uh, Wen Jun Wang from National Tsinghua University. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, nice lecture, I really enjoy it. What is the most enthusiastic research you wish to do beyond your current focus on LIF and histidine kinases? And the second is how to keep motivated. That's a question from a youngster uh, <laughs> that for fifth, working on this for, for 50 years. <laughs> uh, the next question is how to distinguish your lucky results uh, mid from uh, artificial, was not artificial. Artifacts. Was not artificial. There are many standard uh, ways of molecular biology. Should we use it or not? Such as uh, uh, just the uh, protein analysis in SDS sample buffer. Uh, if an unusual or conceptual the unexpected results came out. How can we interpret that? Gee, a lot of questions. What I want to do next, um, I'm not sure that I have anything burning to do. Um, the histidine phosphorylation study will take me a few years. You know, I'm 75 now, so how much longer am I going to do this for? I'm not entirely sure. Um, how does one stay motivated? Well, obviously, there's a lot of positive feedback. So um, if you get an exciting result, that energizes you to keep going through all of the things that don't work. And there are a lot of things that don't work, as I'm sure those of you who do experiments in the audience know. Um, I think having you know, more than one project is probably a good idea, because if one isn't working, the other one might be, and vice versa. So certainly, I encourage people to have a couple of different projects. And I, you know, when, if you get an academic job, or even as a postdoc, but if you get an academic job, I encourage people you know, to have a, one safe project, probably following up what you did as a postdoc, something that's going to work. Um, but they also try and start something a little more risky that you don't necessarily have any grant support for, but which might develop into something important. And I do think, and I would have said, you know, if I talked about mentoring, 
that um, it's, it's important in biology to ask key questions. So don't just fill in the details, but try and ask a, a question that might lead to a, a, some totally new direction. Um, it's easy to do, you know, the next obvious experiment. It's harder to think of an experiment that might take you in a new direction. Um, what else was that? <laughs> okay, no, what else? Lucky oh, lucky results. How do you distinguish a lucky result or an artifact from a real result? Well, you know, scientific method tells you that if you find something unexpected, you should reproduce it. That's the first and most important thing to do. If it doesn't reproduce, then it was an artifact. If it isn't, if it is, okay, if it's real, then the question is, is it important? There, um, intuition may help. Um, you have to have a feeling about whether something is likely to be important or not. Now, with the tyrosine phosphorylation, I was, a little, I was uncertain to start with. It wasn't clear whether it was, even though the result was real, whether this was a, simply a, a virus-specific enzyme intermediate and it had no, no, no importance in, um, in normal cells. It turned out I was lucky in the sense that I had a postdoc who brought a new project to the lab working on Rasacoma virus so we could happen to be working on the two viruses which, which gave us um, you know, the insight into this being important because it was two viruses were doing it and with the RAS we could show that there was cellular tyrosine phosphorylation. Um, so you, you, know, you try and use your scientific training to figure out whether what you're seeing is likely to be biologically Im important and don't dismiss it to start with, but don't pursue it too long. If it looks like it's not leading anywhere, then move on to something else. But there is luck in science, there's no question. I mean, I would say the two things that were really important for me was that bit of luck, but also having a good scientific biochemical training and being in a great scientific environment where my colleagues could help me. When, when, so. Several of the things we did would involve other faculty members in the institution at the same time. So, okay. Uh, the next few questions, somewhat related, I'll read them. First one is from Xi Zhong Ting, a freelancer of uh, translation. It's she is Xi uh, Zhong Ting. Yeah. Uh, what would you give advice or how to encourage the young people to face the unknown future? <laughs> and the next one is from uh, Yu Qing Zhen, NTU. Do you have any advice for students who are going to study PhD abroad? And the third one is from uh, Sheng Yu Zhang from NTU uh, Ecology. And he said, for the young researchers who are looking for uh, topics, uh, should uh, one aim at own, one's own research or to aim at uh, solving practical problems such as uh, sustainability, uh, food, energy source, etc.? So these are the three questions. Okay, so the first one was basically how do you stay motivated, right? Is that what it was? I mean, how do you... Oh, how, how do we face the future? That's right. Um, I don't really have a good answer to that one. I would say, as I said right at the start, there is plenty yet to be discovered. So I wouldn't worry about running out of things to discover. There's plenty of new biology out there that we haven't even thought about. And uh, you can see in the past few years, you know, things like non-coding RNA, small RNA interference. Um, new lipid signaling molecules. There's just a whole lot out there to be discovered. So I don't think that's a problem. I think the main problem going forward is whether there'll be funding to do research. And I find that more and more students who interview for our programs are not interested in an academic career. They, they want to potentially go on and teach somewhere or they want to go into pharma 
they're not willing to, to try and undertake the challenge of, of being an academic scientist and raising the money and training people with all of the worries that go with it. So, I, you know, I, I'm optimistic that, um, that funding will continue to be put into basic research. I think politicians realize, although they don't understand it, that, you know, you still have to fund basic research. Not everything can be translational. Um, and so, you know, while it's difficult times in the U.S. right now because we have a totally non-dysfunctional Congress who can't decide anything, um, and the president who would like to cut funding by 20% to NIH because he doesn't think it's useful, um, I, think it'll, I think funding will continue to, to be um, available. I would say one issue, and I talked about this with someone earlier today, that uh, the past 50 years has been the golden age of biomedical research. And starting out 50 years ago, it was easy to get an academic job. Um, but each of us who started our career then has trained another 20 or so people who themselves have started labs and have trained another 20 or so people. The exponential growth of the field is simply, or the discipline is simply not sustainable. We can't train all these people and them to expect to find jobs. So I, I do think there is an issue about training too many scientists. That said, um, you know, it's important that the very best people continue to go into biomedical research. We still need great minds, creative minds, to solve um, you know, the outstanding problems. I mean, in my field, cancer, you know, we've made a lot of progress since Nixon declared war on cancer in, uh, in 1971. He, I think, expected, just like Kennedy did with putting a man on the moon, that at the end of 10 years there will be a cure for cancer. And of course, we're nowhere close even now. We have some success stories, but clearly the major cancers, you know, prostate, colon, lung, breast, we haven't really got cures for. We're doing better, but we need to do a lot more. So that was that. The next thing was about students studying abroad. Um, yeah, I think getting a new experience is good. Obviously, you may have a language problem abroad. I mean, I don't know. That might be an issue if you went. Depends where you went. Uh, certainly, um, there are great universities in Europe and the US and Japan that can give you a good training. I think it may depend a little bit on what your ultimate ambitions are. Do you want to come back to Taiwan and get an academic job here, or do you want to get an academic job abroad? Um, there are certainly a lot of Taiwanese scientists in the US, as Xing Zhen will attest. Um, so, of course, you never quite know. I think, you know, I went to California thinking that I would spend two years there and come back and spend the rest of my career in Cambridge, and it didn't work out that way. So you, you never know whether if you go and study abroad, whether you'll come back. But I think, you know, in principle, yes, it's, it's a good idea. You'll get new experiences and uh, learn new culture as well as um, new science. So, and the final one was... <laughs> Oh, what research topics would I go, would I start? Well, I talked a little bit about, yeah, I'm not sure that I will, but if I were starting out again, I would become a neurobiologist. I think understanding how the brain works is really the ultimate challenge. Um, can the human mind itself understand how it works? I don't know. Uh, but there's now a huge effort and a lot of money going into trying to understand various aspects of brain function, circuits, um, anatomical, um, molecular analysis. I mean, one of the, you know, the most interesting thing that's, uh, the, one of the most interesting technologies that is actually extremely important in studying the brain as well as cancer is single cell RNA sequencing. And so it turns out that when you do this on a cortical 
population of cortical neurons, instead of being one or two types of neuron, there are 30 or 40 types of neuron. And so we've totally underestimated the complexity of uh, neuronal populations in the brain. And in cancer, obviously, single cell RNA sequencing is telling us about the heterogeneity of tumors, which creates its own challenge in trying to treat the cancer because you're not treating one cell type with a fixed type of genomic you know, structure, but many different cells with different genomic structures. And so if you kill one cell type, maybe another cell type will take over and potentially be a cause for resistance to a targeted drug. And so technology, new technologies are very important. And so to come back to this issue of should you know, should you focus on something translational like sustainability or food production, I think those are, are critical things. And if you, if you have a passion to, to try and help humankind, then I think, you know, going into an area where you can do something like improve crop um, drought tolerance, thermo tolerance, um, CO2 fixation, all of these things will be, a, will be a great thing to do. I think you'll need a training in basic science to do it, but I think it will be a great, a great ambition. Um, whether you should do technology development, I think that's probably equally important. There are, there are people who made their whole careers out of uh, developing new techniques that were used by other people. You can think of Roger Chen, won the Nobel Prize for his development of GFP as a tool for the rest of us to use. Fantastic. He'd also developed the first calcium fluorescent indicators. Again, fantastic. First uh, protein kinase biosensors. So while he might argue he didn't make major discoveries of new biological principles, his tools have enabled others to make those discoveries. So I think people who develop technologies are equally important. And if you have that sort of mindset, I think you should do that as well. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, only the next question is from T. Ting Chao from NTU. When and how did you realize the pH of the old buffer changed? All right. So I didn't tell that part of the story. So um, we were using this old buffer for the first experiment I did on June the 14th, and the second one, and the third one with the phosphotyrosine marker. Uh, when I got back from... Um, England, after that whole month away, um, I decided I should do this properly. I will make up fresh pH 1.9 buffer. And um, so I did that, and I, I ran out the marker phosphotyrosine, phosphotyrosine, phosphotyrosine now. And much to my horror, the phosphotyrosine now landed right on top of the phosphotyrosine. And so I realized that something had happened. The old buffer was clearly different from the new buffer. And so I then spent about three days reusing the new buffer over and over again until I got the same result as I did before. And then I realized that the buffer has acetic acid and formic acid in it. It's a mixture of the two. Those of you who have any chemistry will remember that formic acid is a stronger acid than acetic acid, and so it has a it has a higher boiling point or evaporation point. And so what happens is if you continually use the buffer and pour it in and out of the bottle, which we used to do, the acetic acid slowly evaporates and you're left with formic acid. And formic acid is, it, if you make a solution of 1% formic acid, it's pH 1.7. And so um, that's basically how I figured it out. Thank you. Uh, Tony, the next question is from uh, Shang-Chi Guo from Genome and System Biology degree program. I guess it's from NTU. Thank you for your exciting talk. You have mentioned that the key to keep a passion for research is changing the field. But there are so many different research fields in biology, which let me wonder, how do you decide to go on the future? Moreover, when you choose the way to walk on, what will you do to prepare for the new direction, which may be unfamiliar to you? Well, um, 
In the case of histidine phosphorylation, it was something I've been interested in for several years just because of the analogy between the histidine ring and phosphorylation of that ring and phosphorylation of tyrosine. So I've been, I had a student actually, we tried to make phosphohistidine antibodies back in 1990. Um, and I dug out his notebooks actually the other day and looked at what he had done. And he'd, he'd done the right experiments that simply didn't work because we use phosphohistidine as the antigen and it wasn't stable enough, I assume, at least. So he gave up and pursued another project for his thesis work. Um, so that was sort of a long-running interest. I had sort of been following the field a little bit. Then luckily I ran into a chemist who was, we talked to me about these new analogs and he said he could help us and I, so we immediately started to collaborate and he made the phosphotriazolalanine analogs that were, and built them into peptides that we then used to immunize. And I persuaded a new postdoc in the lab that this would be an interesting project, but risky. I, he knew it was risky, but it turned out he got it to work and it was, it's been very successful. So that one you know, was sort of a long time in coming. Other times it's like when a new, if a new postdoc comes to the lab and has an idea, um, I say, fine, let's try this. I mean, mostly people come to the lab because they know what we work on in signaling and post-translational modification. And so um, it's whatever they propose is going to be something in that general area. And so John Pines came to the lab. He had cloned the sea urchin cyclin protein. But no one had done anything on human cells yet because they hadn't really been used as model system for cell cycle analysis. And he persuaded me that he should clone the human cyclins, which he did. And so that was sort of really a, a, an accident of having someone come to, the, come to the lab with a good idea. And as I said in my talk, um, when he cloned the cyclins, we had no idea that this would be connected to phosphorylation. It just so happened that cyclins associate with CD, CDKs and CDKs are kinases. And so things came together again in an unexpected way. Um, probably the most unusual project that I've done in the lab was not anything that I thought was, well, I, I knew it was interesting, but I didn't think we'd ever do it, and that is to work on axolotl limb regeneration. So how many of you here know what an axolotl is? That's one. <laughs> not many people, okay. An axolotl is a type of amphibian. Um, it has an immature stage which is aquatic and it's one of the few vertebrate species where you can get complete regeneration of body parts including limbs. So if you cut the limb, the leg off an axolotl, it grows a totally new perfect limb within the space of about four months. Uh, so this is truly remarkable and the real question is why to axolotls, but not frogs, not a you know, common a garden frog, have the ability to regenerate limbs and other body parts. They can even regenerate their heart. And so it has been used as a model organism for, for regeneration to try and understand why, um, why we can't regenerate parts. The genome of an axolotl is very similar to ours. I mean, you know, it's obviously different, but many of the genes are the same. There's no totally new principles that an axolotl uses. And so I had a postdoc who studied this and came up with some interesting findings. But it was just, for me, it was clearly an important process. You know, I mean, a question, how, how can an axolotl regenerate a limb? And why can't I regenerate a finger? What's different? Um, the molecules involved are very much the same. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm intellectually curious. So if someone comes to me with an interesting question, and I think it's worth pursuing. I'll find some money, and we did it for a few years. We're not working on it any longer, but it was it was it was a great great project. So sometimes it's someone coming to the lab. Sometimes it's something I think of um, based on something I heard. I would encourage, by the way, people in the audience to go to seminars about which they know nothing at all. You never know when you might not hear something that's relevant to your research.
I, I can't get people in my lab to go to, talk, go to talks on neurobiology, for instance, or yeast. I mean, they, they think they, they won't learn anything, but the fact is you won't know unless you go and listen. And half, you know, it's amazing how often I can come out of a seminar and tell someone in the lab, you should have been there because they talked about this, even though it wasn't in the title. So I would encourage all of you to be, you know, uh, willing to, to listen to something um, that might not appear on the surface to be important. The next question is from uh, Yuxuan Chen of uh, Institute of Biochemistry, Academia Sinica. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors have great success in cancer therapy, but how to solve the drug resistance problem? Uh, how to study the drug resistance mechanism? Right, well, I talked a little bit about this earlier. I mean, drug resistance is a real issue, as I'm sure my colleague here will tell you. You develop patients, unfortunately, develop resistance. There are several, I mean, there are several known mechanisms. One is um, mutations in the kinase target, which blocks binding of inhibitor molecules, and that you can impart a overcome by developing second generation inhibitors which can inhibit the mutant kinase so that's one thing that can be done uh, a second mechanism is a bypass mechanism in which a separate tyrosine kinase pathway takes over and substitutes for the first pathway and in that case, potentially, if you have an inhibitor to that tyrosine kinase, you can use a combination of two tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And the third mechanism is um, something totally different that is un unrelated to a tyrosine kinase signaling pathway. And there, one's going to have to, you know, for each, each resistant cancer, one's going to have to do molecular precision medicine analysis to see what it is that might be driving that particular tumor and then hopefully you'll have a drug. Um, but if you don't, then yeah, that's, that's a problem. So I think recognizing up front that resistance will, will develop is important and potentially using a combination of two drugs, as I said, say to Abel, you can, there are two different types of drug to which it will, each of them individually, you can imagine a resistance mechanism, it would be very hard for a cancer cell to find a way to develop both types of mutations simultaneously and still have a viable kinase. So I think the hope is that by using combinations up front, one may get around the resistance mechanism in part. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, for these uh, wonderful uh, discussions. Uh, because of time, even though we still have a few, quite a few questions, I think we uh, will have to uh, stop the forum and we want to thank Dr. Tony Hunter for his marv masterful, marvelous uh, forum that he led us to understand so many things through his research and his vision, his passion and the way to go in research to benefit humankind which is the spirit of the town prize. He really has done that for all of us uh, to improve our health and well-being and happiness. Thank you very, very much, uh, Tony. Thank you, Jim. And let me wish all of you the best of luck for the next 50 years of research. Yes, thank you. And I, thank you. So in closing, I also like to thank the panelists, uh, the audience, the staff, and everyone to make this uh, Town Price Week, not only today the forum, the whole Town Price Week, such a wonderful happening, uh, led by Dr. Uh, Jesse Chen, the CEO of the foundation. And uh, once more, uh, let, he has an announcement that he wants me to make, that is the presentation slides from the laureate lectures on September 22nd can be found on Town Price website and is open to the public for reference. So you can just go to the Town Price Foundation and click on that to get these uh, lectures. Once again, let's thank Dr. Tony Hunter for your marvelous contribution to improve the health and well-being of humankind. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Hunter, for sharing with us. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for hosting a wonderful session. 
and a sincere thanks to all the panelists and the audience for your participation. I would now like to invite our panelists on stage for a group photo. 各位来宾，我们等一下尚有嗯拍照的环节，所以敬请各位留步。I would now like to invite the entire audience to stay and take a group photo along with our guests. Please, can everyone move closer to the center? Now let's take a group photo with the audience as well. Please, 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 对，往中间，旁边的请往中间靠。请大家再往中间，再更集中，更靠近中间的位置。谢谢大家。今天还有很多空位，所以可以的话，麻烦请往里面移动，谢谢Thanks for everyone's participation, and this is the end of the Master's Forum of the 2018 Tom Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science. Thank you for your participation. Please check around your seat for your personal belongings. We wish you a pleasant day. Thank you. Tang Tang 大师座谈生技医药厂到此结束，感谢各位来宾的参与。离开时请留意您的个人物品。祝福你有美好的一天，谢谢您。If if anyone wants to ask me a question, please come up to the front. 如果您有任何问题还想要询问，呃，前面的来宾，呃，请来到前面。